All right. Good evening, everyone. It is uh, seven o'clock and uh, we want to make sure that we start on time uh, tonight. I pray that everybody is doing well. I pray that uh, all of you are uh, having a great Thursday. And I just pray that um, you're seeing the blessings of the Lord in your life today. So we want to uh, open up with prayer and just a couple of quick things, and then we'll go right into the lesson for tonight, which will carry over uh, for a couple of weeks, probably anyway. So uh, that'll be a good thing. Give us an opportunity to kind of at least dive into this a little bit. Um, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful for another day. Lord, we are we are just thankful and we do appreciate God. We don't take this day for granted. It's a day you didn't have to give us, but Lord, you did. And for that, God, we are just grateful. Father, have mercy upon us. Bless your people. Bless those who are with us in Bible study tonight. Bless those who are normally with us, but for various reasons are not. We pray, Heavenly Father, that although we are far apart, we pray, God, that tonight you bring us together by your holy word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us tonight, Lord. Help us to be edified from this lesson. Help us, God, to know more about you and your power. Help us, Lord, also to glorify you in this Bible study. Father, continue to bless this church and all that we do in your name. It is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen and amen. Um, I want to, uh, again, as always, there's no bad questions or anything about it. So y'all can ask me anything you want. I'll do my best to answer that from the word of the Lord. Um, we got in-person service coming up these next two Sundays, October 1st and 8th. And um, so I encourage each and every one of you, if you're able to make it, come on out. But we certainly have virtual service. Uh, as well. And I've told you there's a, a word from the Lord, certainly on uh, this Sunday. And I just pray that you just continue to keep us in prayer in that. Uh, and then Bible study will continue in uh, on next week as well. Um, I think it's that following week, which is October the 12th. We want to have, have an outpatient medical procedure. So I pray you just pray for me in advance on that. But we um, uh, will, Lord willing, have Bible study again next week as well. All right. With that being said, um, I wanted to look at tonight, if there are no questions or anything like that, I go into, um, I wanted to look at uh, what would be my title, I guess, is the anointed one and the anointing. Um, now, this is going to take a little while. It's going to take a couple of uh, weeks to do this. And so um, I at least wanted to uh, uh, at least, you know, talk about this and um, dive into it and study it. Um, and so uh, we'll see some different aspects. We'll see some different purposes and things like that. But the purposes and some of those things like that will come uh, next week uh, or, you know, um, thereafter. What I wanted to do tonight is focus primarily on, I was going to kind of do a little bit of intro with, with some definitions and some scriptural support in that. And then I wanted to dive into the anointed one a little bit and look at the aspect when it comes and applies to obviously that being the Christ. And uh, we'll get as far as we need to get to tonight. Um, uh, many of my members have often told me that uh, the only person who's concerned about how far we get on the Bible study is me or the timing of it is me. And y'all have been telling me that for years. I try to do better uh, with that. But again, I, I always still want to make sure that I do uh, right by the word of God and some things and just Randall has his own issues and sometimes those get in the way. <laughs> so, uh, but tonight I do want to look at this, and this is the the nature of this. So this will be part one of the anointed one and the anointing. Um, and so we want to look at that. So just from an intro perspective, we'll deal with this, and then I'll kind of cut through to scriptures, and then I had to kind of format this the way I wanted it tonight so we could kind of go through certain aspects as well. And like I said, if you have any questions on uh, anything. It doesn't have to be on this. It could be on anything. I'd be more than happy to do my best to answer those for you as well. All right. So let's look at this. From the intro perspective, it means very simply this. Anoint means to set someone apart, to authorize and equip him or her for a task of spiritual importance. And that is that is key for as you know, to anoint someone. Jesus Christ is set apart by the work of the Holy Spirit for his ministry of preaching, healing, and deliverance. The Holy Spirit sets Christians apart for their ministry in Christ's name. One of the things I've said, and I'm going to leave this up just for a minute. <clears throat> there are abilities as in talents, and those are great. Nothing wrong with that. Though there are, or you know, abilities and attributes, if you want to say it however you want to say it. 
there are, again, accolades that come because people are, all of us are wowed oftentimes by, by really set apart attributes and abilities, right? Wherever they are in whatever arena they are. But the anointing is different. I use this, and I mean this respectfully. The way I'm going to say this, I'm going to just lay this out this way, and I, I think it's a good analogy because I think it does speak to that. All right? So y'all just stay with me in love. If you don't have to agree with me, that's fine. Whitney Houston's ability and attributes of singing were like none other that I personally have ever heard. I think Whitney Houston's voice was like nothing I'd ever heard. From a talent, an attribute, um, and an ability perspective, I certainly would do that. But one of her dear friends is C.C. Wines, and her anointing, does her abilities and her attributes, CC's abilities and attributes do not compare to Whitney Houston's attributes and abilities. But the anointing on CC one is different. So here, I'm going to give it to you in, a, in a, just a simple definition, if I would, in this. One can have ability. One can be gifted with attributes. But the anointing makes the difference the anoint okay <laughs> attributes and abilities will wow you the anointing will defeat the devil <laughs> the anointing made things happen and that's it, it, that's his sin and, and i know you know some people like well why in the world would you do that at the beginning of bible study because y'all know i don't do things conventionally so it is what it is in essence, that's what I want you to understand. And the reason why is because when you are anointed, things happen because you have been set apart and you have been authorized by God to do a work. So attributes and abilities don't give you authorization. I'll let that sit. But when you have authorization by God to do a work, when the anointing shows up, doesn't matter the ability of the person, doesn't matter the attributes of the person. When the anointing shows up, those who have, may have can be considered with greater attributes and abilities can't move the devil, <laughs> can't, move, can't, can't move on God's behalf without the anointing. So ability and attributes mean nothing without the anointing. Lack of ability and attributes don't matter if you have the anointing. I hope y'all can understand the kingdom math. That's all I want you to see. So that's why I say the, to anoint means to set someone apart, to authorize or equip him or her for a task of spiritual importance. Right? But Jesus Christ was set apart by the work of the Holy Spirit for the ministry of preaching, healing, delivering. The Holy Spirit sets Christians apart for their ministry in Christ's name. Just that simple, right? Under the anointing, there's a power that is not there with just ability and attributes. Under the anointing, there's authorization by God to do that work. All right, let's keep going. To anoint or anointed is a procedure of rubbing or smearing a person. That, again, that's to anoint a person or a thing, usually with oil for the purpose of healing, setting apart, or even embalming, because we do see that as well as in uh, the anointing of dead bodies. A person can anoint himself or be anointed or anoint another person or thing, which is true. We'll see it in scripture. While olive oil is the most common element mentioned for use in anointing, uh, oils produced from castor, bay, almond, myrtle, cypress, cedar, walnut, and fish were also used. In Esther 2 and 12, for example, the oil of myrrh is used as a cosmetic. The Hebrew word, and I want y'all to see this in the Hebrew word uh, for anoint, an anointing or, or, or so or, or to anoint is so interesting. Mashak is a noun that also means Messiah. And the Greek word chiro means crystal as a noun for crystals. They are both translated to anoint. That's why we will focus tonight a little bit more on the anointed one is because to anoint is tied to the Messiah. It is tied to the Christ. 
That's why it's not anything to play with. From ancient times, the priests and kings were ceremonially anointed as a sign of official appointment to office and as a symbol of God's power upon them. All right. But see, here's what I do want us to understand, too, is that and I've said this already, but I will say, you know, again, the anointing is nothing to play with. So even if one is ceremonially anointed as a sign of an official appointment to an office and as a symbol of God's power upon them, it's still nothing to play with. That's why if somebody is anointed as elder, anointed as a deacon, anointed to serve in any capacity or whatever, that, 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 that's nothing to play with. That's, that's why those persons who, who have received that shouldn't be out living an unauthorized life. That's the way I put it. That's why one of the things I do love about those who serve the Spirit of God, who received the anointing of God in this house, is that they don't play with it. But, but again, I just want us to understand that outside of you, it's just nothing to play with because, again, it ties itself to the Messiah and to Christ. The authority comes from heaven. And that's the thing that people need to understand. All right. The act, as far as uh, anointing, was, was imbued with an element of awe. David would not harm King Saul because of the anointing. We're going to go through some of these scriptures here uh, in just a moment. Uh, king Saul, because of the anointing the king had received. Likewise, Israel and even Cyrus are called God's anointed because of God's working through them. Israel came to see each succeeding king as God's anointed one, the Messiah who would deliver them from their enemies and establish the nation as God's presence on earth. In the New Testament, anoint is used to speak of daily grooming for hair, treating of injury or illness, and for preparing a body for burial. Christians see Jesus as God's anointed one, the Savior. The same symbolism as in the Old Testament is employed in this usage. God's presence and power are resident in the anointed. Likewise, Christ, uh, likewise the Christian is anointed by God for the task of ministry. Not self-promotion, not misuse, but the task of ministry. That's why the anointing is there. The purpose of ministry. Okay. All right. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. First uh, Samuel 24 and 6. As he said to them, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. This is when David had an opportunity to kill Saul or to do him harm. But David understood it. And, and, and so the reason why it was the one who has received the anointing, even if it's ceremonial, ceremonially for a position or for a specific task, should respect the anointing, right? But by the same token, should those, those who are outside of that, even if the one who has received the anointing is doing wrong for their role, they still should have respect for the anointing because the authorization came from God. God will deal with the, with the one who is misusing or not living up to their authorization. Let God deal with that. That's not your place. That's not my place, right? So David was saying, look, Saul trying to kill me and I'm innocent. We, I'm, I think I, I get to that a little bit later in, in more in a full context. David was like, I'm innocent in this though. But I'm not going to put my hands to him. I'm not going to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Here's the other aspect by which, it, first of all, David had such a respect for the anointing itself and for God's anointed one in that role and in that position, regardless of how they were behaving. He was going to leave that in the hands of the Lord. What David was not going to be guilty of was to raise his hand against the Lord's anointing. See, and that's what happens a lot of times is you got to ask yourself the question is, what am I guilty of in this? Yes, I can point out their sin. I can point out their guilt. I can point out. The, it, it doesn't mean I condone it, but I'm not going to be guilty of doing them harm. I'm not going to be. David was saying I'm not going to be guilty of that. 
And so that's something we have to understand. There has to be a respect for it on all sides. That's the point I want us to make, wanted to understand. Psalm 89, 19 through 45, this goes in a little uh, greater piece, a little bit, a little length. Then you spoke in a vision to your holy one and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. Now, I want you to look at this from two perspectives. One, that David is the one who God has anointed, but then also Israel is the people that God had placed anointing upon to be his people and how disappointed he was with them in, in the context. That's why I went kind of long on this particular scripture. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I've exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. God said, listen, I anointed David. I'll deal with David when David is wrong, but I've anointed David. I made that clear. Israel's supposed to be my people, right? And, but again, just because somebody has received or been given the anointing don't mean that they're living up to it, but God will deal with that. With whom my hand, he's talking about David, whom he's anointed, with whom my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. So because David had received the anointing, God was going to be with him. He was going to strengthen him. Verse 22, the enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I want you to see what comes with the anointing. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. Why? I'm going to go back here just a minute to verse 19 and 20. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Then he spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I've given to him, uh, given help to one who is mighty. I've exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant day with him. I mean, with my holy oil, I have anointed him. And because of that, he was doing all over. Let me keep going. Verse 24. By my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy, I will keep him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also shall I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Verse 30, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. God said, I'm going to do this. Nevertheless, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. It's because he had the anointing and God had given to him. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my, of my lips. Once I've sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even the faithful witness in the sky. Stop and ponder that while the music plays. Verse 38. But you, now he's addressing Israel. You have cast off and aboard. You have been furious with your anointed. See, because again, they were coming against the one whom God had anointed. You have been furious with your anointed. God said, because I anointed him as your king. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the, in the battle. You have made his glory cease, cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame. Stop at the music place. He was chastising Israel because of the way they treated David in that and what was going and then he goes on and he he's going to deal with them let's keep going though i mean well not in that same scripture i'm going to go to another scripture that was mentioned isaiah 45 1 and 2 this is this tells you how god will anoint a person for a particular task thus said the lord to his anointed to cyrus 
whose right hand I have held to subdue. Here's, here's the purpose for it, though. He's anointed Cyrus. He's held him by his right hand for what? To subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in the um, pieces, the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I want you to understand sometimes God anoints somebody for a particular task, but that's God's call on that. And when God does it, they shall be, they shall be able to accomplish the task. That's one of the reasons why I say you have to respect the anointing, even if it's, even if it's for, for a particular task. But those, those outside of it must also respect it as well. 1 Samuel 2 and 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven, he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointing. Now, what I find interesting on this is what we've seen, and I hope some of y'all have caught this already. If you'll notice, God talks about his anointing, <laughs> not those who've anointed themselves and put themselves in position and place. When we talked about earlier in the definition, yes, one can anoint themselves for healing. One can anoint their house. All of those kinds of things. We'll look at some of those when we get next week into some of the purposes of anointing. But what God is saying is when I put somebody in place, when I have placed my anointing upon them, those are the ones who I will provide strength to and I will exhort the horn uh, of those. And I will enable them, supernaturally empower and enable them to do the task that I've assigned them to do. Okay? All right. Matthew 6, 16 and 18. Moreover, when you fast. And Jesus, Jesus was telling them about this, even in that. And so we talk about some of the different purposes and different functions. Sometimes it is about a cosmetic piece. It is about a particular function in order to do that. And that's why we'll get into those much more detail next week. But I want to look at this just in some definition pieces. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they just figure their faces that they may appear to men to be fast. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. And, and you know what's interesting about that? When, when you see Jesus talk about this in the biblical text, about people announcing their alms or what they give, he said they have, you know, they do it to be seen by men praying, long and everything else like that they do it to see to be you know and then in the synagogues and all that kind of stuff wearing great robes and all it says they have their reward when you see jesus talk about they have their reward they got their reward here on earth there's no reward for them for that in heaven because you got your reward because you wanted to do it in front of people you wanted people to think that you're so holy you wanted people to think some something great about you you wanted the accolades not the anointing <laughs> Amen. Well, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they just figure their face that they may appear to men to be fasting. So, all right, you want to appear to be holy and all of this kind of stuff. Sure, I say you have your reward. You have your reward because your reward comes from men. It doesn't come from God. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in, in the secret place. And your father who sees you in secret will reward you. That's when the anointing talks about anoint your head and wash your face. It talks about again. That becomes a cosmetic piece, whether it be your hair, whatever it may be. In other words, look like you're going to look like you're all right. You don't have to do that for men. God says, I know what you're doing in secret. I'm going to reward you openly, but I'll do it in my own way and in my own time. Luke 10, 34. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. We see the anointing for even that as well, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him, he set him on his own animal, brought him to, the, to an inn and took care of him. This is the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan looked at him and one that was in need, he, he went to him, bandaged his wounds, putting, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care. So even at that, the oil was used for a mode of healing or help, if you will. All right. Mark 16, one through eight. And this is for a dead body because they came prepared to do that to Jesus's body, which is an interesting dynamic, but it was beautiful. It was beautiful still in itself. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and, and Solomon, Solomon, Solomon me, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Him is Jesus, who was in the tomb. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. 
And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But they brought the, they brought it to anoint his body, right? They brought the order to anoint his body. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Y'all know I love that verse. That he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, and they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. But they came for that purpose. And here's a scripture that you will hear a lot of from me during the course of this Bible study is Acts 10, 38. And it, here's the, the smaller context. I have it uh, in a larger context a little bit later. But it just speaks to this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. I want you to see the connection between the anointing and the Holy Spirit and power. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Here's the manifestation who went about doing good. See, you really can't do good in this old flesh of ours without the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And the anointing that comes by the Holy Spirit and with power, right? And healing all by, about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. See, here's the thing. I want you to look in this verse. This verse is so rich if you will, is showing an example of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, right? Who went about doing good. Now, so he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. So the anointing holds, in other words, that the Holy Spirit must be present and there must be, and power is comes with it. And it is manifesting this going about doing good. <laughs> and but look at the healing and healing all who were oppressed by the devil see that's why when we when we'll see a little bit later about setting the captive free that's what some of the enablement of the anointing does the anointing makes it clear for god was with hmm all right. First Corinthians chapter, chapter 1, 21 through 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us is God. Paul was telling to the church of Corinth, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. There's a connection between the Holy Spirit and the anointing. There is. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. In 1 John 2 and 27, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you. You know why? Because the anointing that abides in you will teach you, but the same but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. All right, let's 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 look at this a little bit. Now, um, I want to look at this this way, and I'm gonna give you the fullness because I know a lot of my members will take screenshots, a lot of them will go back and 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 study on their own and things like that, but I'm gonna break this down into each piece. A little bit, but I want you to see it in its totality. I know it's going to be a couple of pages as it is, but I want to show you what, what I want to look at with Christ being the anointed one. So we're going to look at Jesus Christ, anointed by the Holy Spirit, right? And then we're going to look at each aspect. The Messiah's anointing is predicted. The Spirit anoints Jesus Christ at the start of his ministry. Jesus Christ declares his anointing. The first Christians declare Jesus Christ's anointing. Evidence pointing to the Spirit's anointing in Jesus Christ's ministry. Jesus Christ as God's anointed one, the Messiah. Jesus Christ receiving the Holy Spirit at baptism was his anointing for messianic work and the link between the anointing and the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, and then, of course, believers anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit anoints God's chosen people. Anointing enables Christians to stand firm and anointing guards Christians against falsehood. 
then there's a figurative use of the anointing, the anointing by God. His physical anointing is seen in symbolizing divine anointing. The word Messiah literally means the anointed one. And then uh, God's people in the Old Testament, we'll look at that, Christian believers as well, uh, and how they dealt with that. All right, so Jesus Christ anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Messiah's anointing is predicted uh, in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, Messiah means anointed one. So let's look at this in Isaiah 61 and 3. The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, I'm, I'm going to read this and I'm going to come back to, to this verse. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give be them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. All right. So there's, there's a lot here in these three verses. But let's look at this slowly. So here's what it is, and it, and, it, and it lays out very simply that Jesus Christ is anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Messiah's anointing is predicted in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, all right? Jesus will affirm this later, which we'll show in the next one. But, but again, so here's Isaiah saying what is going to happen. So the Spirit of the Lord is, is God is upon me, right? Because the, because the Lord has anointed me to preach Here's what the anointing really is for, especially when assigned in purpose and especially in the life of Jesus Christ. Preach good tidings to the poor. Well, one of the things that you preach to the poor is that, again, that there is salvation that comes, that there is, that again, um, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God, right? Um, that, 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 that we, again, through his poverty might be rich, right? So again, there are some things that rich as in good works, rich as in filled with his spirit, all right? But here's the thing, that he preaches good tidings to the poor. My God shall supply all my needs. All of those things. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, right? So when the anointing is present, there still shouldn't be a whole lot of brokenness but there is a healing that comes as a result of that to proclaim freedom or liberty to, to the captives whom the sun sets free is free. Indeed, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And the opening of prison to those who are bound, in other words, to set those who are captive, who are bound to set them free as well. That's part of what the anointing does to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. See, again, when one is anointed, they're going to preach what the word says, not what they feel like. There is a day of vengeance of our God. There is a day of wrath that does come to those who don't believe. There is a day of penalty for the sins that, that one commits that aren't covered under the blood of Jesus Christ or forgiven because someone didn't petition God for forgiveness did not see God for forgiveness to comfort all who mourn. Listen, when you lose a lover, when you lose somebody near and dear, you need that the anointing provides that. It does. It provides comfort to all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion. To, now y'all look at who mourn, to comfort those who mourn and console those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes. See, in, in other words, to give them beauty from that, the, ash, the sackcloth and ashes that they put on, which was symbolic of the loss or mourning. In other words, to train, to, 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 to change and exchange, right? The oil of joy for mourning. So there's an exchange that the anointing provides. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. You, look at this. To give them beauty for ashes. I know you're mourning. Let me give you beauty for ashes. Part of the beauty is a good news. That we'll see them again. If Those who die in the Lord. That we'll see them again. That they're truly in a better place. The oil of joy for mourning. That, they're, that they are now with the Lord. 
the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I'll make an exchange, but I'll praise God even, for in exchange for my heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness. You know what a tree is? A tree is one, a tree of righteousness is one who's been right a long time because you don't just become a tree. The planting of the Lord that, that, that he may be glorified. Jesus Christ is the exchange here. Christ coming gave us beauty for ashes, joy for all of joy for mourning, because he is anointed one who brought in anointing. The garment of we have something to praise for the spirit of heaviness. We now have life where there was death, that they may be called, we can be called trees. In other words, if we if we are covenant connected and we grow in him, trees of righteousness planning of the Lord. Why? That he may be glorified, not us. Let me say this in love, because Christ is the anointed one, right? And y'all know I've said this. I'm going to pause for a moment here. A service is not what you call it. A service is not a service because that's what you call it. A deliverance service is not a deliverance service because you call it that. A healing service, not a healing service, because we call it that. An anointing service is not an anointing service because we call it that. It is that because God says it's that. So without the name, the name don't matter. The presence of God matters. God can deliver whenever he wants to. God can heal whenever he wants to. God can anoint whenever he wants to. That's all I'm saying. All right, let me keep going. All right, so Jesus Christ is anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Messiah is anointed and predicted. Again, in, in, in Isaiah 61, the, secondly, the Spirit anoints Jesus Christ at the start of his ministry. And I want us to look at this a little bit through some of these scriptures, all right? Matthew 6, 3, I mean, Matthew 3, 16. Now, some of these scriptures, again, I didn't put them all in there because, again, with the Synoptic Gospels, uh, I think Mark speaks to the same as Luke and, and things like that. When he had been baptized, y'all know when John the Baptist baptized, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the wall, all right? Which means he had been dumped, right? Because he, if you come up, that means you went down, right? Came up from the wall, immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, all right? Luke 3.22 Speaks of that, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in whom in you I am well pleased. John 1 32, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and, rem and he remained upon him. There is a connection between the anointing and the Spirit of God being upon him. All right. So again, we see this at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, all right? Uh, and again, the other scripture that was there was the Acts, and I, I can go back to Acts 10, 38, which was there is how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, all who, uh, who went about doing good and healing, all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, all right? And then in the third aspect, let's look at this, is at the bottom here, it says, Jesus declares his anointing. And what this does is what we see is the fulfillment of what Isaiah predicted in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. All right. But we but I want to look at this in its full in Luke 4, 18 through 21. This is Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Let, OK. That's why we must preach the gospel. Not any other gospel. No, the gospel that he preached. So the gospel that he's talking about is the one that speaks to that the Savior has come to save sinners from their sin. They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the true gospel. Not anything else. Not live your truth. Not God ain't going to send you to hell for that. That's not the gospel. Just do your best. That's not the gospel. <laughs> the good news is that I am a sinner 
on a on a fast track to hell. But God sent us in. That's the gospel. That's the separating piece from Christianity, from all other religions, from Christ, from anyone else in the entire existence of humanity is that he is a savior. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. See, you know, I know we have physical infirmities and everything like that, and I don't dismiss that at all. But man, I'm telling you, when you are brokenhearted, that's a pain, that's an angst that is so different. From, from from having knee pain and hip pain and back pain. I, I don't dismiss knee pain and back pain and hip pain. I don't dismiss that now. But I'm telling you, brokenheartedness is something that, that despondency, that grief is something. But Christ came, his anointing came to heal that. Let me keep going. To proclaim liberty to the captives. You are free. Oh, my goodness. See, here's the reason why that's good news, because there was no relief in sight. There was no freedom in sight without him. There is none without him. And recovery of sight to the blind. Y'all, you know, Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That means he's that means if you're not born again, you're blind to the kingdom. Here and there. You can't see what God is doing here without the Savior, without the anointed one. You can't see it. And you certainly can't see what's there, what's beyond that, without the anointed one. Also, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He didn't give a time frame, but he said he would. Let me say this to those of African-American descent. Yes, we were brought to this country in, in chains, been oppressed since we've been here. But you know where the freedom really began to come? When people would worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? You can dispute that with me all day long, but I got plenty of proof on that. But what has happened now? <laughs> we done moved on up to the east side. And now... I'll say it like this. I'm going to move on. You know, when I grew up, <laughs> my parents would say, what you went, what are you wearing? Do you have your church clothes laid out? What you wearing? Nowadays, parents say, are you going to church? You feel like going? Okay. All right. Amen. Amen. I'm going to let, I'm going to leave that alone. All right. And then you wondering why. Amen. All right. <laughs> To set at liberty those who were oppressed. You say, I don't understand why things ain't changing. Because you know why? Because we changed. We were at the throne. Hmm. Now where we at? Okay. Uh, verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, this is not... When Isaiah said it, he couldn't say this piece in verse 21, but it, because he was here, fully human and fully divine, he, and he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What he was letting them know is that the anointed one is before you. This fulfills what Isaiah said. Isaiah predicted it. Isaiah prophesied it. But now it has come to pass. What we can take from this in 2023 is that because of Jesus, let me go back, because the spirit is upon the good news, there's been good news that has been brought to the pool that he can because he was sent to heal the broken heart, that we can be free, we can see, and we can be free from our oppressors because of him. Okay. I just wanted you to know that. Let's keep going. The next one is not only um, is that the first Christians declare, G declare Jesus Christ anointed. 
All right. So they even declared the fact that he was the anointed one. All right. And Acts chapter four, verse 26 through 28 said very simply this, the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for truly against for truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, Pontius, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So they were against it to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So here, here's what's going on. They're declaring that Jesus was the anointed one. They're declaring his anointing, even in Acts chapter four, and that Herod and, and, and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together against him. But it didn't stop the fact that he was anointed and he still accomplished everything he was supposed to do in verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done, and it was done. You, okay, so here's what I want us to understand as we look at Jesus as the anointed one. Because I want to get into this later on next week as we talk about this in a little fur further detail. When, when the anointing of God is upon you, there ain't a devil in hell that can stop. If you're operating in his anointing, if you're doing good and doing what you're supposed to be doing, there ain't a devil in hell that can stop what God has assigned you to do. And that we need to know. And that's the example we see in Jesus Christ. All right. Christ is the anointed one. No doubt about that. All right. Not only did they, there's evidence now in this next piece of pointing to the spirit's anointing in Jesus Christ's ministry. And I do want to take some time and kind of go through these uh, in, in, in detail a little bit. There's evidence. See, I, I know I you utilized the example. And, and again, I'm not, not throwing no shade on Whitney Houston. I'm not throwing no anything on her. You know, she's gone. I, if you ask me, I believe Whitney, Whitney had it, had some level of relationship with the Lord because she wasn't ashamed of that. What I want you to see though, is that talent and ability or ability and attributes do not equate to the anointing because what happens is in the anointing, there is evidence that the anointing is present. There is evidence that the anointing does what God has assigned it to do and that it brings things to pass. There is evidence in that. Listen, that many of you know that I've talked to you about this just from my own perspective as your pastor. I'm not, I don't have great ability in attributes. I don't believe that at all. Um, it, 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 I understand everybody like preachers to be able to sing. I understand pre they want to preach to be able to do this, that, and other. Okay, that's fine, willing, good, do whatever. But I, what I want is I want God's anointing. Let me tell you why. Because I know that that attributes, right, and abilities ain't going to help you if I'm not giving you his word. His word is not going to manifest in your life if there's not an anointing on me to do that, right? So what I tell God all the time is, look, that's fine, willing, good. I, I don't have no problem with anybody who's got great ability and great attributes. But when I do what you assign me to do, whether it be Bible study, prayer call, I don't care what it is, priest the word, teach the word, whatever it is, pastor, whatever it is, I just want your anointing presence so that it is known that it is you doing it. There is something far beyond Randall involved. That's the thing about it. And there's evidence in that in the lives of people. Evidence because it brings glory to God. Evidence pointing to the Spirit's anointing in Jesus Christ's ministry. We can learn from this. Matthew chapter 24, 23 and 25. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Not a different gospel, not a gospel of man, not the gospel of whatever, but the gospel of the kingdom. And as evidence of his anointing, because he was the anointed one who had an anointing and healing, all right, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of diseases among the people. So certainly it not only heals the brokenhearted, but the anointing also heals the physical infirmities as well. Verse Matthew 4, verse 23. Um, oh, let me keep going. Verse 24. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. See, that's the spiritual aspect. That's demonic stuff now. And those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. 
there was evidence that he was the anointed one who had an anointing to do what the father had sent him to do. And it was manifest in the lives of people. It was manifest to where there was no doubt that it was the anoint that he was the anointed one who had the anointing. Matthew 7, verse 28 through 29. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes had academic intellect, but Christ had the anointing. Which means academic intellect does not equate to authority from heaven. Nothing wrong with academic intellect. I ain't saying that. What I am saying is when there is, when you're teaching with authority from heaven, people are astonished. That's what the scripture says. That's not what Randall says. When you have academic intellect, people are not astonished because you may not have authority from heaven. See, and so it was when Jesus ended these things that the people were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he taught, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The academics and the anointing are different. I'm just saying, again, nothing wrong with the academic aspect of it. I'll, I'll tell people, in, I'll, I'll always tell people, seminary was a great journey for me because it was the journey that God had put me on. If God didn't send somebody to seminary, seminary would do them no good. Okay, I know that don't, that flies in the face of a lot of other things. I'm telling you, because seminary won't bring you the anointing. But what it will do is if God has sent you then, then God then, <laughs> as a result of your obedience, then God is the one who can give you authority in that. But seminary alone by itself doesn't do it. Let me keep going. Matthew 12, 22 through 28. Then one was brought to him who was demon possessed, blind and mute. <laughs> and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Y'all, I mean, <laughs> and all, verse 23, all the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Why are y'all even asking this question? Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. And look how simple this is. It says, and he healed him. So that, here's the manifestation, the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. He was demon possessed to the point that it caused him to be blind and mute. Jesus healed him. Spiritually and physically. And all the multitudes who were amazed said, could, could this be the son of David? Well, if it's not the son of David, who is it then? Let me keep going. Verse 24. Now the Pharisees heard it and they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Well, if the man demon possessed and he's doing it by Beelzebub, why would he cast out the demon? That would defeat the purpose of him being demon possessed. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they, sh they shall be your judges. It's like, if I'm casting out demons, well, I mean, who y'all casting them out by then? If I cast out demons by the spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. He was already preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What he was telling them is I'm casting out demons by the spirit of God. Because the kingdom has come upon me. Y'all want to dismiss and diminish what I'm doing. Y'all want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit by attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Beelzebub or to the devil. 
Jesus said that first of all, which <laughs> first of all, what y'all are saying doesn't even make any sense. The man is demon possessed, and I'm doing it by by Satan. Why would I cast out the demon then? You know, I, I'm convinced that Jesus will say, sometimes just listen to what you're saying. He said, but I but I did this. But, but if I cast out demon by the spirit of God, because there's a connection between the spirit of God and the anointing, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you because it ain't the kingdom of Beelzebub. It ain't the kingdom of darkness. All right. Luke 5, 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. When the anointing shows up, when the anointed one is there and the anointing is present, there's power to do what the Father is sent it to do. Luke 6, 19, and the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and he healed them all. He healed them all. <laughs> Right. Again, even with the one with the issue of blood, he said, I felt the virtue go out of me. In other words, there's power that went from me because he's the anointed one who had the anointing. The whole multitude sought to touch him. The power went out from him and he healed them all. Nothing fake. Nothing pre-orchestrated. Nothing designed for outside show. But the truth of the power, the evidence of the power, was there. Luke 7, 14. Then he came and touched the open coffin. Y'all look at this. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother. The anointed one, the anointed, there was evidence of his anointing. He made that very clear. All right. Last one, because there's only two uh, two scriptures to go with it. One of them we've, we've talked about as well. Last one for tonight, because I, I have more than that as we go forward. Well, mm, let me stop, because because this goes into a whole nother piece. Let me stop. Let me stop. Just because, yeah, that'll give me a good stop for me. We'll we'll get into this again next week, and then I'll also have time to get into some of the uh, some of the people, some of the uh, purposes of. It. All right, all right. Are there any questions or comments tonight? Thus far, everybody okay? I guess y'all quiet. <laughs> Amen. It's all right. So the anointed one and the anointed will pick up in, in part two next week. Uh, I'll make sure that we get that. Just a couple of quick housekeeping issues, if not, because I want to take a moment to pray. Uh, over the house, just a lot of things going on as well, uh, if we may, and y'all can spend some time with me in that as well. Uh, and then uh, Sunday, in-person service, uh, 10 o'clock, if you're in the local area, come on out and worship with us. And then Bible study, we'll pick up on this next week on the anointed one and the anointing, okay? Amen, amen. All right, if you would, let us um, let us close out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for this night. We thank you for your many blessings. Heavenly Father, we just are grateful for this opportunity to come before you. We thank you that you anointed Jesus, the Christ, that the word itself to anoint or to anoint, anointed, really means Messiah or the Christ. We thank you that the anointed one came with his anointing, God, and we, have been, we are benefactors of it. And now, Lord, we ask that you anoint this church to do the work you called us to do. But, Lord, we allow your anointing to permeate for those right now who are having physical challenges within this body, that you heal and touch their body. God, many have procedures that are on the horizon. Many have had procedures, some this week, some recently, Lord. Let your healing power be upon them. Let, them, let it be evident, God, that there is an anointing in this house that comes from you to bring you glory. Father, we pray for those who are brokenhearted those who grieve, those who mourn. Father, it doesn't matter how recently or how long ago. Father, their brokenness is still their brokenness, and we ask that you heal it by way of your anointing. Heavenly Father, we pray that if there's any who are bound, that you set them free by your anointing. 
We pray, Heavenly Father, that there's any who have not heard the good news of the gospel, God, that, that they hear it in their ears. Father, we pray that there are any be poor among us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that by your anointed, that your provision be abundant in their lives. Father, it is our prayer tonight that you continue to help us, God, in this world, as much darkness as there is, that you help us to stand firm on your holy, on your holy word, God, and continue to, to just go forward and go further in you each and every day. Heavenly Father, it is our prayer and our blessing that these Bible studies are pleasing in your sight, that God, you're glorified in them and your people are edified. Help us, Lord, to walk in the power that comes with being tied to Jesus Christ. And Lord, individually and collectively, allow your anointing to rest in us to do the work that you've assigned us to do, to carry it out, Lord, and help us to always have respect for the anointing that you have placed upon people for specific assignments, specific roles, and in general. And Lord, help us to respect the anointing that you do place upon us, that we might go out and do the tasks that you've assigned us to do with a supernatural power, empowerment and enablement that comes by way of your Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. And we all sit together, amen, amen, and amen.